In his story, Life is Like a Loaf of Bread, Stuart Perkins tells of a conversation between a stranger and an elderly woman on a park bench. During their conversation, the old woman draws a brilliant connection between life and bread. All of us are a little like bread, the old woman said with a smile on her face. We're born with the right ingredients. We're all pretty much made from the same recipe. What happens next? Well, that's the tricky part. Early on, we need some things to help us along or we don't come out right. Some of us just fall apart, like bread with too much flour. Some of us never rise to our potential, too little yeast. The most important thing, the woman continued, is once all of the ingredients are mixed together, we have to be needed. We all want to be needed. Hopefully in the beginning, all of us are set up with the right ingredients, right proportions, and are always needed. Because a lot can happen to us in a lifetime. Life has a way of baking the fire out of us. The stranger next to her on the bench replied, Well, you seem to have come out of the oven just fine. The old woman stopped smiling. Well, you know, a lot can happen to us in a lifetime. Life sometimes holds us down, squeezes us tight, tries to shape us in a certain way. And all of that business about life baking us, we need it to happen, even if it's rough. It's got to happen. By taking the heat, we become beautiful stuff on the inside. Life baked me good sometimes but I didn't let what burned me on the outside ruin what I have on the inside. The stranger replied, You seem to have handled the heat quite well. The woman leaned against her cane. Too much crust, and no one cares to find out how beautiful you are on the inside. Don't ever let life make you too crusty. I love this story, and I think it, it sure does give us a lot to chew on. Sorry, I know that was a, a crummy joke. But, uh, but, but seriously, I think there's a lot to be said about this metaphor between life and bread. And this is something that Jesus does. Jesus compares himself to bread. I am the bread of life. He says, this is my body, which is broken for you. But he also compares bread and the kingdom of heaven in the parable that we are looking at this morning. Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at uh, Jesus' parables in our sermon series, Moral of the Story. So far, we've looked at the parable of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the hidden treasure, and the parable of the pearl of great price. And today, we are exploring the parable of the leavened bread. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Matthew chapter 13, verses 33 through 35. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. There was a series of old Dunkin' Donuts commercials from the 80s and 90s. They ran for about 15 years. And some of you may remember these commercials, but one of my favorites was with Fred the Baker, who would get up early every morning and before dawn, and day after day, he would, he would wake up and he would go out his front door to bake fresh Dunkin' Donuts. And when he would leave for work, he would say in a sad, somber tone, time to make the donuts. Then each evening when he returned home, he would say in an exhausted sigh, I made the donuts. Back and forth, he would come and go morning and evening until finally he would end up running into himself. Time to make the donuts. I made the donuts. 
by the end of the commercial, you could tell that he was totally worn out. And I promise that I'm not getting paid by Dunkin' Donuts to preach this sermon. Although, I do think that donuts are a holy food. Uh, but this commercial points out something important for us this morning. And that is, whether you are baking donuts or cakes or biscuits or bread or whatever it is, if you're doing it from scratch, it takes a lot of effort. And if you want to bake bread fresh, then you have to do it often. You have to do it every day. Baking bread takes time. It requires you to work to knead the dough, squeezing it, shaping it, forming it, molding it. The leaven is mixed into the flour where the yeast is alive and moving, but the yeast is also hidden at the same time. And the mixture of ingredients rests sitting in a bowl that is covered with a dishcloth so the fermentation process can take place. And the evidence of that hidden yeast is revealed when the dough rises and bubbles rise to the surface. As long as that yeast is alive and active and working, it will be revealed in the rising and in the baking. Usually, when yeast is mentioned in the scriptures, it carries a negative connotation. For example, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, Watch out and be on your guard for the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. In his first letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul uses yeast as a metaphor to talk about the negative effects of boasting. In Galatians, Paul also says that a little bit of yeast affects the whole batch of dough. It's kind of like saying one apple spoils the whole bunch. Yeast is almost always used as a metaphor for evil in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. But here, in this parable... Yeast is used as a direct reference to the kingdom of heaven. Everywhere else, yeast is seen as a negative thing. But Jesus has this power to turn something negative into something good. After all, you can't have a loaf of bread without yeast. I love how Richard Lisher, a professor from Duke Divinity School, says it. This is a story of a woman baking bread and for that, yeast is essential. He goes on to say, The kingdom is on the rise, and its agent is not a holy man in the temple, but a woman in her kitchen. At first glance, this parable seems kind of boring and ordinary. A woman mixes yeast into flour. What's the big deal? There doesn't seem to be anything odd or special or unusual about this parable until we realize that this woman is adding a pinch of yeast to a mountain of flour. In her book, Short Stories by Jesus, New Testament scholar Amy Jill Levine explains this further. Three measures in first century terms is not synonymous with three cups. Three measures of flour is somewhere between 40 and 60 pounds. The dough would be far too much for one woman to knead on her own, and the yield would be far too much for one person to consume. The image is one of extravagance or hyperbole. It reminds me of another story in the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis, Abraham and Sarah are visited by three strangers who are servants of God. We get the sense that these strangers are either angels or maybe they are a physical representation of the Holy Trinity. Either way, in a show of hospitality, Abraham invites these three strangers to lunch. He tells them, let me offer you a little bread. The three men agree. So Abraham tells his beloved wife, Sarah, hurry, get three large measures of your best flour, knead it into dough, and bake some bread. Again, like the woman in this parable that Jesus told Abraham, asks Sarah to use three measures of flour, 40 to 60 pounds of flour to make, quote, a little bread. Um, I cannot imagine inviting a couple strangers over for lunch and then going to my wife, Allie, and saying, Hurry up, 
Make 60 loaves of bread real quick. I don't think that that would fly. Even though she's a fantastic cook, I don't think that would end well for me. Um, this is an insane amount of bread for just three people. And we can see that three measures of flour is not your typical recipe for an ordinary loaf of bread. Something is going on here. Maybe the massive amount of flour has something to tell us about God's abundance and extravagance, like Amy Jill Levine had said. The woman here, maybe she doesn't want to just make one loaf of bread. Maybe she doesn't want to just feed herself. Maybe she doesn't want to just feed her family. Maybe she doesn't even want to just feed her entire village. Perhaps she wants to feed the whole world. Well, according to a 2019 study by the United Nations, we produce enough food to feed everyone on the planet. Right now, we can do it. We literally can feed everyone in the world right now. And yet, around 821 million people are chronically undernourished. And I think food is something that we take for granted. We we have access to grocery stores and restaurants. Our pantries and refrigerators are overflowing with more food than we can eat ourselves. Many of us live within abundance, but there are people who are literally starving to death. That's why I'm really glad that we have the Etowah Community Food Pantry here at Wesley Church. Um, from January to May of this year, the food pantry has filled 318 orders, which has helped 866 individuals. Our food pantry is open two days a week, every week, with the exception of Thanksgiving Day and the week of Christmas. And if you've never experienced the food pantry here at our church, I want to encourage you to come by on a Tuesday or on a Thursday from 9 to 1145 and to check it out and see what's going on. Maybe you can come and volunteer and help. Um, it's really an amazing ministry that we do for our community. And I think that this is the exact sort of thing that Jesus was all about. We see this in the story of the feeding of the 5,000. After spending a full day, a long day of healing a numerous amount of people in the crowds, um, the disciples go to Jesus and they say, Jesus, it's, it's getting a little late. Maybe you should send the crowds home so that they can go and eat something, um, get some food for themselves. Because there are no other food options. There's no McDonald's nearby. And there's this crowd of more than 5,000 hungry people there who, who have no food to eat. And, and interestingly, instead of sending them home, Jesus tells his disciples, give the people something to eat. The only problem is the only thing they have Five loaves of bread and two fish. That's it. So Jesus performs this amazing, incredible miracle by feeding 5,000 people plus the women and children with only five loaves of bread and two fish. And they still have enough left over. They have 12 baskets full of leftovers. This morning... Jesus is telling us that the kingdom of heaven is not just for you and me. The kingdom of heaven is for everybody. There is more than enough bread to go around. There is so much that we have leftovers. In the kingdom of heaven, I think that there will be more than just those familiar faces that we love around the kitchen table. Kind of like a pinch of yeast and a mountain of flour. It's going to spread and reach the whole mixture. The kingdom of heaven will spread to all the nooks and crannies, to all the overlooked spaces and places, to all the people who have been ignored and marginalized and pushed out of the way. The kingdom of heaven is for all. As Amy Jill Levine says, Perhaps the parable tells us that despite all our images of golden slippers and harps and halos, the kingdom is present at the communal oven of a Galilean village when everyone has enough to eat. It is present in everything and it is available 
to all. In this morning's parable, I don't think that we are the yeast. And I don't think that we are the flower. And I don't even think that we are the woman who is kneading the dough. Instead, I think that we are the ones who are invited to come and eat at the table. We are the ones who are invited to break bread and to feast. So I think God is the yeast. I think God is the flower. I think God is like a woman who is hard at work, measuring out an abundance of flour, kneading the dough, baking the bread, and inviting us, you and me, to take and eat. I want to close by this uh, with this prayer from uh, Kenneth Sehested. Bread baking God, as you nourish us with the bread of life and the milk of your word, let your spirit hang an apron around our necks, fashioned and patterned like that worn by our Lord become friend Jesus. Instruct us here in the halls of your kitchen kingdom with the recipes of mercy and forgiveness, of compassion and redemption. Live in our lives till they rise in praise offered, blessed, and broken for the healing of the nation.